Dirt track racing is hotter than ever, and today's horsepower is all about building a high revving four-banger race engine. You'll be blown away at how much power you can get from this 2.3-liter rocket. Unless you're seeing double, you might think we're four pistons and a cylinder head shy of what we need for a typical horsepower engine build. But this is going to be no typical build. You see, our very first four-cylinder engine project is custom-made for short track race competition. With about a thousand short tracks to run on, dirt track racing is the most common form of auto competition in America. It's fun and it's affordable for fans and racers alike. Why, you could watch a full night of competition for less than it costs to park your car at a NASCAR race. Clarksville Speedway is a 3 8 mile dirt track where local drivers compete in nine classes, ranging from mini sprints to late models. Drivers come from all walks of life and at all ages and sizes. Logan Brown's only 13 years old and recently stepped up to the mini modified class. A cool class with fewer rules than many others. His new number 10 car is powered by an Esslinger 2300cc engine like the one we'll build today on our show. So how did it feel compared to the mini sprint he used to drive? A lot faster. There's really no other words for it really. I mean this is triple the horsepower so it's a lot of learning experiences to do. Esslinger Engineering is a family company that specialized in four-cylinder Ford performance for more than 30 years. They've developed and refined a single overhead cam engine that powers everything from drag racers to, well, many modifieds like Logan's car. Esslinger Engineering made about 90% of the parts here you see that we're going to use to build our own four-banger race engine. And, well, Dan's the man that runs the company, grew up in the business. What kind of thought process goes into building an engine that can run 8,000 RPMs for hours? Well, you first have to start with the belief that whatever problem comes up, you can solve it. So mechanically, when things go wrong, you look for, for what's, where, the, where the area is that's failing and, and you fix it and move to the next area that fails. Well, he more than fixed it. He redesigned most of it from the crank and rods onto the aluminum high performance heads. He even cast his own modified 2.3 liter block for the engine. Well, interestingly enough, the components of this race engine had their origins in a production motor that powered vehicles, well, like your dad might have driven. Architecturally, it's the same 2.3 Lima engine Ford produced for several of its vehicles from 1974 to 1997. Now we've got this one in here just to show you its makeup. Now it came to us from a nationwide company called LKQ who specializes in used and rebuilt automotive parts. Now Lima's, named after the Lima, Ohio Ford plant, came in several different configurations from carbureted setups, EFI like this, even intercooled and turbocharged engines. This one came out of a 93 Ranger pickup. It's 140 cubic inches and has two plugs per cylinder. Plus, it's a distributorless ignition system. We'll start the teardown by removing the EGR tube that connects from the factory tube header to the throttle body elbow, followed by the elbow itself. The intake manifold is aluminum and houses the injectors, fuel rails, and several sensors. With that removed, we can see the D-shaped intake ports for this truck head. In 83 through 85, these were round. Some of you may have had one of these Lima engines in the past that only had one plug per cylinder. Well, the second one is to increase the speed of combustion by providing two flame fronts. It means for a more complete combustion cycle, better emissions, and reduces the possibility of detonation. Lima engines feature a more modern overhead cam design. It doesn't use push rods, so the lack of gives a reduction in valve train weight for more stability at higher RPMs. Roller cam followers and hydraulic valve last adjusters make up the valve train components. Behind the timing cover, a cog style belt is turned by the crank, which also turns the oil pump, rides against the tensioner, and finally turns the camshaft. Now loosen the tensioner, remove the accessory belt pulley, the crank sensor reluctor hub, the sensor, its bracket, and the timing belt. Now the oil pump pulley has to go. 
to make way for the back half of the timing belt cover. The front cam bolt also doubles as an oil gallery plug. Now the cam is oiled from a lower and an upper hole in the cam towers. Then oil is forced through the core of the cam to each individual lobe where a small hole oils the roller in the follower as well as the rest of the valve train components up top. Was it effective? And that was just turning it by hand. Finally, we can remove the oil pump drive components. Now you know the basic lowdown on Lima engines. Next, you'll see how to build a high performance version for racing at 8,000 RPM. Today on Horsepower, we're building a race engine capable of high RPMs, lots of left turns, and the power it takes to win races and all kinds of four-cylinder classes. It starts with a block cast and machined by Essinger Engineering, and it's designed to handle up to 1,200 horsepower and engine sizes from 2 to 3.1 liters. The cylinder walls are much thicker in Siamese, the main webs are heavier, and then we built it out of better material. On all levels, it's, it's quite a bit stouter than what, what we started with. The factory Ford crank is a cast piece that can handle some abuse, but it does have its limitations, like small counterweights which can restrict how fast you can turn this thing in the RPM range. Overdo it and you're going to have some messed up main bearings. Now the Esslinger crank is constructed out of billet steel. This thing weighs in at 38 pounds and it's built in-house. It has a 3350 stroke and it can handle 10,500 plus RPMs and 1200 horsepower. We're laying it down on lubed up, coated cleavite bearings. Now we can slide on the rear main seal and the beefier, stronger Esslinger cap. And lube the ARP studs with ultra torque lube. We'll torque the mains in three steps, 30, 60, and 90 foot pounds. I wish you could feel how smooth this turns. We're gonna fill the bores with JE pistons that are light forging with flat tops dual valve reliefs, and vertical gas ports. Now we loaded ours up with low tension total seal rings. Esslinger also makes the I-beam connecting rods. They're a lightweight design, 5.7 inches in length, and made of 4340 billet steel. There she is. Another weak link in the 2.3 was the factory auxiliary shaft. Now this thing is made out of cast and it was prone to breakage right in front of the journal. Now the Esslinger piece, it's made out of billet, has a drive for the fuel pump and is about 400% stronger. The oil pump rides on a needle bearing and that allows better oiling to the front main since it doesn't get lubed by pressurized oil anymore. The most important step to take when assembling a four cylinder engine like this is to use Loctite on all the fasteners except the rotating assembly and the cylinder head bolter studs. These engines naturally create a lot of vibration and it will loosen the fasteners. Loctite keeps them in place. With the oil pump drive in place, we can bolt a Melling high volume pump to the block. And this Canton pickup will guarantee we are at the right depth in the sump. The billet Esslinger timing cover can go on next, followed by the five and a half quart Canton oil pan. Now it's designed for left turn circle track racing with three trap doors and a built in crank scraper. It'll clear stock starters and it fits Fox Body Mustangs, Pinos, and Mini Modifieds. Now first thing to go on in front is the auxiliary shaft seal cover. Then the Esslinger water pump, followed by the timing belt cog drive on the front of the crank, and the pulleys, with the belt loosely attached. Here's our stock cast iron head next to the new aluminum SVO we're using. Major differences are the SVO's larger valves and smaller combustion chambers. Esslinger not only designed this SVO head, they machine it in-house with larger intake runners that are designed for a better shot at that valve. Now when a guy orders one, he gets his choice of cam profile and other components. And well, these things have turned out to be really popular with midget racers, uh, hydroplanes, off-road trucks, and in our case, of course, circle track racing. It'll sit on a Felpro gasket with a 51 thousandths compressed thickness. With the flat top pistons and 40 cc combustion chambers, the compression ratio is gonna be 12 and a half to one. ARP studs will hold the head in place with the same 30, 60, and 90 foot-pound torque sequence we used on the main. 
Another trick piece on the head are these lash cap stands father designed. They accommodate more lift by adding a radius tip. His dad even invented this tool to install the factory followers and have been proven to last in extreme racing conditions. These mousetrap clips act as a noise suppressor when running a solid lift camshaft. This next step is pretty interesting. For all you V8 guys that use magnetic bridges, dial indicators, and degree wheels to time your engines, throw all that stuff away when timing one of these. Now Dan likes to use what he calls an E-bar. You place it on the front two lobes of the camshaft and rotate the camshaft until the E-bar is flat and level with the cam tower. Once that's done, we know that the camshaft's on TDC. Now we can come down to the crank, rotate it to TDC on the pointer, and route the belt around the tensioner and onto the pulley. I gained a lot of respect for this little engine and the parts Dan designed for it. It's on to the dyno next. We're back and continuing our first four cylinder engine project. Every modification was designed for circle track racing, including the cam. Now it has a broad power and torque band through the entire RPM range. It's a single pattern with 620 lift, a 111 and a half lobe separation, and duration at 50 is 269. And we'll cover it all with this cast aluminum valve cover from Esslinger. To mount to the dyno, we got a bell housing adapter from Canfield Industries. It converts the 2.3 bolt pattern to that of a 5 liter Ford. We also had American Powertrain machine a custom flywheel with a 2.3 crank pattern, but a 5.0 pressure plate pattern for our drive flange. Inside the dyno, in goes six quarts of Klotz 1550 race engine brake in oil. It stands choice for all his builds. The intake is another one of Dan's designs he's proud of. And like most of his parts, made in-house and in the USA. My dad did his time in the service and he's a firm believer in and everything Amer America and American is better. Racing started here, so I don't know why we'd take it anywhere else if we didn't absolutely have to. The intake is made for a Hawley 4112 two-barrel carb that floats 500 CFM. It's mandated by several sanctioning bodies. For electric spark, a Mallory Unilite distributor, along with a set of Sidewinder 8mm wires. Dan even brought a long tube header with fittings for our EGT sensors so we can monitor temps at each of the tubes. With a tank of 110 racing fuel and a quick float adjustment, it's time. For 20 minutes, we ran the engine at different RPMs and different engine loads. This was to ensure that the ring seat properly and the oil temp is hot enough to make some pulls. For the first run, we'll set the timing at 32 degrees. According to that, it's just dead rich. Now we're swapping from 80s to 62s to lean it out. We finally got a run in the bag, but there's a small issue. That third cylinder is still ice cold. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're going to see until we put that baffle in. Two and four are running, you know, they're running the right temperatures. One and three are, are pretty cold. Basically, all the fuel is going down one and three. Jamie Miller, our cylinder head guy, and I spent about three days one time coming up with this baffle that we put in the intake manifold to kind of redirect the fuel and even out the fuel flow to each cylinder. Typically, it goes in and, and the exhaust temperatures get more even. We can jet a little more aggressively, make a little more power. So I'm going to throw this in and see what happens. Baffled? You won't be. Dan's a master at finding horsepower in his modified 2.3s. Stay with us. We're back, along with Dan Esslinger, tuning one of his modified 2.3 race engines. Now he's using an intake baffle to equalize fuel delivery, monitored by cylinder heat. Number one and number three were thirsty. Three and four. That four got really hot, real hot. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. No flow bench required, just experience, plain and simple. Let's trim that off and see what that does. Cylinder four leveled out, but at the expense of three. One more minor trim. All right, this will be the one. Wow. Yeah, that's 
nice. They got a lot better everywhere. Everything's within five degrees except number three hole. And it's only 100 off. Yep. We also got an impressive 253 horsepower and 200 foot pounds of torque. Time to start building on that with a few more degrees of timing and taking the run to 7,500 RPMs. Two fifty-eight, two hundred four. Run it again. This turned out to be the longest dyno session I ever had the privilege to be a part of. Several timing changes led to multiple cam adjustments. Hey, we found something it doesn't like. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't like any retarded timing. Yeah. Dan knows what's in there, and he's going to find it. You got to try to understand what's going on inside of things. What's going on inside the plenum? Where's the fuel going? Where's the air going? What does it need? You know, what's it going to do on the racetrack? We could chase big numbers, but big numbers don't necessarily win races. You got to have something that runs through a whole range. Wherever they're going to be giving it gas, the thing's got to run. Right again. We try to wear them out on the dyno a little bit just to be sure that we know where they're at. Uh, we'd rather do a little more here than make the customer figure it out. 261, 204. Oh, that's the best number we've seen. Yeah. The next change will be to the carb, installing a power valve block off, which will require larger jets. So back to the 80s. 262, 203. Air fuel is starting to get any better than that up top. No, nothing. Run it again. Well, you heard the man, and the backup run was identical. Time to quit? Not a chance. We'll make another cam timing change back to zero and drop down one jet size. Two hundred and sixty-eight horsepower, two hundred and eleven foot-pounds of torque. So you can win some races with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's all about winning. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a there's a race to go to. All we can do is is do our best and try and make something that meets their needs and, and gets them up front, give them a chance to win something.